Well, it's 1.02. We may have some people joining us, but we are recording. So um, we'll send this out to registrants afterwards. Um, but thank you all for, for joining us today for our letter to the editor training. Um, this is new for us. Um, this is the first time we've done sort of a follow up on some of our advocacy training and, and, and sort of the Q&A format. So we're really excited about it. And, and if you have any comments afterwards, definitely let us know. Um, so just to, oops, no, it's not going through. Trying to, uh, there we go. Um, so we're gonna go through some introductions, introduce you to the Sun team that is handling this webinar. Um, talk a little bit about our theory of change and our solar rights. Give a little bit of background on the FERC petition, um, which is what this this training is is truly focused on. Even though a lot of the best practices will apply regardless of the the policy issue or the issue that you're passionate about. Um, so if you did attend our our webinar uh, last week, a couple of weeks ago, um, it will be a little bit of repeat information, but we'll we'll go quickly. Um, and then chat about writing a letter to the editor. So if you have any questions you have about volunteering or any follow-up questions from this, feel free to um, either go in the chat box um, and answer the, ask there, or you can unmute yourselves. This is a meeting format and not a webinar format, so you're able to unmute and ask questions real time. Um, so feel free to do that. Um, if you have any technical difficulties, post into the chat, um, or you can reach out to any of us. We'll, we'll post our emails in the chat box, and you're welcome to reach out to any of us. Um, and we will answer those questions. Um, so intros. Alexis, you want to start? <laughs> yeah, my name is Alexis Miller. I'm an engagement specialist at Solar United Neighbors. I'm over helping plan our volunteer and um, engagement events uh, for six of our state programs. I've been with Solar United Neighbors for just over a year. And really love it and I'm excited to work with you all on um, this advocacy action as well as our future and upcoming other um, advocacy and engagement events and activities. Awesome um, and I'm Annie Wolf. I'm the Director of Engagement at Sun. Um, I've been here just for a couple of months. I joined in February so it's been really exciting to, to get to know our staff and our volunteers especially through through trainings like this as, as you all are attending so um, and I cover a few of the states as well. Cool, and Glenn is actually not joining us yet. He is the vice president actually, of- I'm here now. <laughs> oh, you are here. Oh. Yeah, I was able to get here faster than I thought. Um, hi folks, uh, my name is Glenn Brand. I'm vice president of policy and advocacy. Uh, and I work with Liz on uh, making it easier for people to take action on uh, solar advocacy. You got it, you're gonna have to unplug your mic again. <laughs> Glad you can make it, Glenn. Uh, Thank you. Hey everybody. I'll say that again. I'm very sorry. I have a long running bad microphone on this stuff. Uh, I, I was saying my name is Glenn Brand. I'm the Vice President of Policy and Advocacy and uh, my job is to work with Liz to do what we can to support solar homeowners and solar supporters to take action on pro-solar policies. Cool. Glad you could join Glenn. Uh, and I'm Liz Beasy, Solar Advocacy Campaigner at Solar United Neighbors and work closely with Glenn. Um, and I started like Annie a few months ago um, and most recently worked uh, around rural electric co-op reform, but I've been doing work around clean energy uh, for almost 20 years. And I live in Omaha, Nebraska. All right, um, should I take over? Yeah, why don't you and stop sharing? Can you just take over? All right, um, so just wanted to start with our theory of change in terms of getting people to go solar and joining together and fighting for their energy rights and sort of continuing that cycle. Some examples include um, improving local interconnection and permitting, creating local solar for all programs, fighting for state laws to protect net metering, um, working to get additional solar incentives or carve outs in like state renewable portfolio standards, um, working on guidance for homeowner associations to go solar, preventing homeowner associations from banning solar through state laws, um, and then doing work at the national level around getting clean energy incentives in stimulus bills, something we've worked on recently, and then this petition at FERC um, 
that threatens to end net metering across the country. So we are going to talk more about that. And yeah, we all, um, you know, are part of this theory of change and um, we all benefit from more local energy and a decentralized, more resilient grid. We all have a stake in the clean energy economy and are compelling advocates. Um, so uh, at Solar United Neighbors, we define our solar rights um, as we have the fundamental freedom to make our own energy choices, right to go solar without interference from monopoly utilities. Um, and net energy metering or NEM is really central to our solar rights or our energy rights. Um, NIM ensures fair compensation for clean energy solar homeowners send to neighbors through the electrical grid. So there's a little bit of background. Um, and then more specifically about the petition at FERC or the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. Um, a group has filed a petition in mid-April to um, asking FERC to rule and basically if they ruled in favor of the petition it would eliminate net metering um, across the country. The group that filed the petition is called the New England Ratepayers Association and they're a sort of secretive group that usually represents um, utility interests and has been fighting to roll back net metering for many years. Um, so the petition would then, if it was, if FERC ruled in its favor, would give the federal government control over state and local policies and likely um, get rid of net metering and make it a lot more complicated and unfair for homeowners, um, for solar homeowners. So we at Solar United Neighbors see this as a huge threat um, to many of our members and to our work. Um, so there's more than 2 million solar homeowners across the United States and more than 100,000 businesses powered by solar that rely um, on net metering with billions of dollars invested in these systems. So. Um, there, you know, is potential for folks to lose thousands of dollars um, if net metering is rolled back. Um, and overall, you know, that adds up to millions of dollars in fair compensation that folks could lose. Um, and, could, and this could fur further discourage future investments in solar systems and really uh, detrimentally impact the solar industry that you know is already struggling under our current um, pandemic but has a lot of potential to really drive local economic growth um, that we really need to help get out of this crisis um, yeah and you know this petition is moving forward at a time that people are focused on the pandemic and public health um, and this group you know, tried to pay money to really fast track um, the petition and move it through. So here's a little more about the petition. Um, so FERC has a responsibility, we think, to protect our solar rights and states' rights to set their own policies like net metering. Um, but we, you know, FERC and uh, your governor need to hear from you and millions of other solar homeowners and supporters now. Um, solar homeowners have the most at stake. Um, so it's really important to speak up on this issue. So the deadline for action is 
like final comments have to be submitted to FERC by June 15th. So we're really pushing people to take action by June 14th. Um, and the sooner is better because we're really trying to leverage action to get governors and state attorney generals to engage. Um, so sooner is better. And well, I guess I didn't put it there, but savesolar.org, maybe one of my colleagues can put that in the chat, is where we're really trying to send people to take action on this. And uh, that's also included later in some of my slides. But I'm going to pivot now to um, talking more specifically about letters to the editor. Um, so we'll start with a little context on why letters to the editor or LTEs are important. And then um, some overall tips and then some talking points around this issue. So LTEs are important. Um, one reason is because decision makers, almost all of them scan uh, LTEs or have their staff scanning letters to the editor to gauge public opinion on issues. Um, and so it's particularly important to mention the specific name of your target decision maker. Um, and so in this case, that would be your governor. Um, so what else? Um, and then other, you know, the public, your fellow citizens also read LTEs and note people's opinions and topics. Um, people relate to authentic personal stories. So that can be an important piece of an LTE. Um, and you know, generally they're relatively easy to get published, but it depends on, you know, in like lo smaller local papers um, versus sort of larger papers, it gets more difficult. So how to write an LTE? Um, most newspapers have a page online. If you go to their LTE or their letters to the editor section or opinion section, usually they have information about how to submit a letter to the editor on their website and or in the paper if you get the paper. Um, but they usually have specific guidelines about length. Um, so that's really important to note. Usually it's around 150 words. Sometimes they allow up to 250 words, but important to figure that out. Um, and as I mentioned before, personal stories are really powerful, so that's an important piece. Um, it's important to understand that your audience knows nothing or assume that they know nothing so that anyone could read it and understand what's happening. Um, you know, so you couldn't you know, in this case, you may or may not even want to talk about FERC, but if you use that acronym, you would definitely want to uh, spell out what it means. Um, explaining why solar is important to you, to your community, um, and then asking people to take action to do something. So in this case, sending them to savesolar.org. So, Here's a couple of tips around sort of structure and just sort of circling back to reiterate the importance of naming the decision maker. Um, and then I've put a picture of a letter to the editor um, from Mike Murphy, who is joining us and gonna talk a little bit more about some letters to the editor that he wrote on this topic um, and got published a couple weeks ago. So in terms of structure, it's good to have a sort of lead sentence, <clears throat> possibly two, but ideally one that's sort of like, what is this? What's the topic? And then to talk about why is this important? And then what can people do? Um, so in this case, savesolar.org is what people can do. And then why does, it, why does this matter? You know, is a place to sort of build in your story um, and your community and why solar is important. And then it's important to name the decision maker. So, you know, if you were in Virginia, you could say something like, I'm counting on Governor Northam to protect our solar rights. Or 
in Ohio, we need Governor DeWine to take action to protect solar and states' rights. Are just sort of some examples of ways you could say that. Um, all right, and we are only a few more slides and then we'll open it up, uh, or then we'll have Mike uh, speak for a few minutes and then open it up for questions. Um, here's some specific talking points around the FERC issue um, that you could include. I mean, I think it's important to think about your story and what resonates with you and what you think makes the most sense to include. Some things you could say are, you could talk about states' rights, protecting states' rights to set energy policy. It's not right for the federal government to tell states what to do or how to set energy policy. Um, you know, that changing the rules of the game is really unfair. Um, that, you know, ending net metering really hurts everyone. We have, if we have less rooftop solar, less locally produced energy, fewer local jobs, a less resilient electric grid, um, that net metering provides fair compensation, um, and that, you know, local solar businesses can be an important part of economic recovery that we need um, right now. So those are some potential talking points. And then a couple final tips or context. Um, and I mentioned this earlier, but thinking about submitting to smaller local papers, you know, even a weekly paper, sometimes those are will, really well read. Um, so it doesn't have to be, you know, a big city paper um, for decision makers to take note. Um, what else? I think generally it's good to try to connect to a recent article that has run in the paper if you can, but I think around this topic that may be really challenging. So uh, it may not be possible, but um, just in terms of future letters to the editor on other topics, that um, usually is a good hook uh, if you can connect to a recent article in the paper in the same paper. Um, most papers require you to enter like your address and phone number with your letter and they don't ever publish that information but they just want to verify um, you know that you're not some made up person and that you really are a person who is you know from where you say you're from. If you're able to get your letter published, it's really great to share it on social media and help sort of build more buzz and momentum and get more people reading it and commenting on it and um, tagging your decision maker and making sure that they also saw it is always good. Um, and then if you want feedback, we uh, at Solar United Neighbors are happy to give folks feedback on letters to the editor. You can email get involved at solarunitedneighbors.org. And Mike, I think I'm turning it over to you. Thank you. That would be me. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Um, Liz hit some great points. And what I would like to share is um, just a few random thoughts here. Uh, one, if you have a personal relationship with your editor, that's even greater. That's better. Uh, a lot of us live in small towns, so getting to know your editor is really important. A lot of editors have, you know, Friday coffees and meet and greets and stuff like that pre-COVID-19. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, get to know the folks that make decisions at your local paper. And then do your research because some papers, like Liz said, are 150 words. Some will go up to 250 or maybe even 300. Um, and then embed any text, uh, any links in your letter as well, because oftentimes as the editor is reading that draft or that uh, potential publication, he or she will want to click on the link to go to the source document that you might uh, quote or reference in your letter to the editor. Um, in the old days, we used to write them and put them in an envelope and send them. Almost always now, they go either directly by email or by a form mailer. 
So do your research again and find out those media outlets in your area, make a list, put them in your address book and have fun. Uh, and lastly, don't be frustrated because not every letter gets published. Great, thanks Mike. That was very nice and concise. <laughs> And then folks have will have access to this um, letter from Mike, or maybe one of us can drop a link to that in the chat um, if folks want to look at Mike's letter that got published a couple weeks ago. We'll also include it in the follow up when we send out the recording. So, uh, but Mike, how many how many letters do you think you've submitted over the years? <laughs> um, probably hundreds. Um, I write about cell phone towers. I write about solar policy. I write about noise pollution. Um, you have to be passionate to write a letter to the editor. It's just not something you can sit down and say, I'm going to dilly around with this. And I think you do have to be concise. And Liz, I'd like to thank you for acknowledging my concise nature. Um, I tend to ramble and I can ramble in words uh, spoken word just as well as a written word. So knowing that 200 or 250 word target is really, really important. And, you know, I've got letters, uh, Annie, going back literally for decades um, about causes that I believe in, and it just becomes a part of you. And uh, this particular letter about uh, the FERC ruling or potential FERC ruling went out to five different papers. Another thing to know is that some media outlets may own all five papers. Uh, usually the smaller outlets don't care, the bigger ones do. Um, and you can also cross post. Uh, Liz mentioned sharing on social media. Uh, you can even take that same letter and mail it directly to the governor. So don't be afraid to get out there and put your best foot, both foot or all three feet forward and have fun while you're doing it. That's some great advice. And yeah, I, I really love the part about being passionate about something that really, I think, is going to come through for sure. So if you have that passion for something, it'll, it matters a lot. That's awesome. Cool. Well, I think I can move us forward. I don't, yeah, I think that was basically the end. And this is the last slide. So if folks have questions, Happy to take those in the chat, or I think people can even unmute themselves and talk. They can indeed. Uh -huh. Since this is a meeting format. Okay, so this is Erin. Can you hear me? Hi, Erin. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, so is it, you know, in your experience, um, I've never written a letter to the editor, and Mike's is really quite erudite, you know, it's it sounds very professional. Um, so do you think the personal story, I sent you a copy of what I drafted before I did this. I sent it last week, I think, but it's, it's much more of a personal story angle. So in your opinion, what is more effective um, or, or should I try to blend both? Because I, it's going to be too long if I add a lot of um, policy related background. Yeah, I, I wouldn't mind. This is Glenn Brand. I wouldn't mind taking that question. That's such an excellent question. Um, the, the balance here is the key. Um, and also knowing that, you know, lots of other people are going to write about this and, you know, you can't do everything in, in one letter. However, it's a really good idea to, to, if you're going to tell your personal story, which we encourage and think it's the most memorable way to make an impression to your audience, um, is to in, make sure you include a call to action. You explain what it is you want people to do, um, not just to think. Um, and so if, if you can, you know, if you, it's really hard. I mean, Mike's, Mike's was 250 words. That was the word limit, I believe, and the one he sent. But many papers have a 150 word limit, which makes it almost impossible to, to both do both parts. So generally, you got to compromise, right? So you, you, you want to tell your story, but you want to make it clear that this is uh, something you want people to act on and not just reflect on. So, you know, I, 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 hadn't, I haven't seen your letter, but let's say you tell your personal story. Uh, you're a solar homeowner. I'm, I'm just projecting. I don't know. Um, let's say you're a solar homeowner, and, you know, of course, you, you entered in your 
in your investment for a solar rooftop system with a clear understanding and promise that you're going to have that metering policy. That's, that's a relevant story. How much money did you invest? How many right. jobs did that help create in your local community? That's the kind of local detail that makes it seem like it was written by a real person. Um, sometimes people cut and paste talking points um, and it sounds like it was written by you know, somebody like me or you know, a robot like me or something. But you don't want to do that. You definitely want to have flavor. Having said that, you know, everyone has a different natural voice. Some people are more formal, some people are more informal, some people like folksy expressions, some people, you know, uh, you know, uh, want to throw out facts. I mean, the, tr the truth is here, it, the most important thing is to be natural uh, and to be authentic. And, um, uh, but you're right, there's no real simple way to, to make sure you're balancing both, except to be conscious that personal stories make a big impression, generally speaking the greater the level of detail, this is true of all writing, of course, but the greater the level of detail, the more memorable it is. Um, but the necessary con word constraints mean that you've got to make sure to pivot, mention who the target is and what do you want them to do and what you want your audience to do. In this case, it's, it's nice and concise. Is that people, you know, I encourage uh, everyone in, in our community to, to go to savesolar.org and to tell Governor X to protect our solar. That kind of thing. Cool. So if you write to the Washington Post, for example, which is goes to lots of different places, yeah. what would you say for the call to action? Because everybody that's three states or that's two states and you know. The yeah. District. That's a good question. And and regional papers sometimes cross borders too, you know, say you're in northern Kentucky and the Cincinnati market, for, for example. The first thing I would say uh, about very large out national level outlets like the Post or the Times or, um, is that your chances of getting published are very slim. The larger the outlet, the less likely you're able to get published because of the sheer volume of letters that they receive and they only you know, pr present big ones, um, you know, only present a very little percentage of those submitted. Um, uh, having said that, Sure, you could go for a, a submit a letter to the Washington Post uh, or the New York Times, but um, you would have to sort of acknowledge that readers hear about this from all over the country. You'd have to change it. You'd have to change your letter a little. The basic talking points will remain the same. Um, uh, you could also do what we do, which is to say, tell you know, please tell your governor. But it's more effective generally. I'm telling you that. Politicians are very, they scrutinize papers for their names. So when you use their name, you're getting, you're, you have much more like, particularly now that you can browse these things, uh, you know, not somebody clipping it, but somebody searching it online. They, they look at every mention. So it is, it is almost always better to have the target's name very clearly laid out. And to, and to, and to say it in a, in a positive way, you know, we're counting on, Governor X and X to do such and such. Okay, thank you. Mike, thank did you, you. Have a comment or question? I wanted just to uh, offer some advice to Aaron. Um, Aaron, write from your heart, write it passionately and just write it. Don't worry about who you're sending it to or how many words it is. And then do a word count. And then when you look that you have 750 words, say, okay, what can I do to make this a little smaller and do it again? Then right. 550 words, 350 words. Maybe you've got an op-ed there on your way to a letter to the editor. So make lots of revisions and copies and have fun. Right. So we just had a question pop in from the chat box. Um, Julia asks, if you submit a letter to the editor to a small local paper and it's not published, what's the best recourse? Resubmit, call the paper and ask why. What, what would you suggest next steps are? Anyone. Well, I, I can just say quickly on that one. Um, it's, it's generally, you know, they, they have a lot of reasons why they don't pull up something. Some of it is just they have limited space. Um, uh, it's a good idea to get to know the editor if it's a small paper and they'll take your call or send, return an email. 
uh, to establish a relationship with them and increases your chances of getting a letter down the road, depending, of course, how you, how you ask about it. Um, uh, but generally speaking, I think most people don't do that. Um, uh, but I think Mike's right. It, if you can get a relationship with that person and you're going to commit to send good letters, they, they will look forward to receiving your letters. Generally, it's good, best practice not to ask why they didn't publish it. Instead, it's to send, send it to another paper. I would say that's what most people would do. Yeah. And this is Liz. I guess I would add that, you know, I think sometimes when I send a letter to the paper and it doesn't get published, they will often publish someone else's letter on the same topic. This topic may be, there's probably fewer people who are writing letters to the editor. So in maybe some sense you're more likely if they think that it's an interesting and relevant topic. But um, sometimes I think that just being part of a group and sending in five or 10 letters about the same topic can be powerful and impactful. And like, they're probably only gonna print one, maybe two of them, but you're sort of helping show the paper that that topic is important and that they should publish an LT on that topic. So that can often, that can also sort of be helpful. Mike, did you wanna say anything? No, I, I, I agree with everything that was said. It's, it's a process and you, you just have to jump in and start it. Um, if they don't publish it, they don't publish it. And they're not going to tell you why. Um, I mean, it's just a moot point, you know. Um, so you do the best you can and you smile and you live to tell about it another day. But the next time you're down at the coffee shop and you see the editor and you buy him or her a cup of coffee, you build that relationship over time so they actually look forward to stuff that you send. And that's when you know you've got it made. I know the editor personally of the Winchester Star and also the Rappahannock a uh, newspaper, and those are great relationships to foster. That's great advice. Anyone else have any other questions or even comments from experiences that they've had? Hopefully you've gotten some good pointers so you're not just sitting and staring at a blank page <laughs> when you sit down to write something. Um, but we definitely were more than happy to take a look at any drafts that you might have, um, you know, for, for this issue especially. Um, and this is something that will, will is a great, a great way to take action on plenty of the, the advocacy issues that we, that we put in front of you all and the ones that we care about at Sun. So um, it's good, it's good material even if you don't end up having a, a letter submitted for for FERC. So. And where would we send that to? If you want feedback, um, that would be to get involved at solarunitedneighbors.org. So that's on most of our volunteer emails, but um, we'll also send it out in the um, in the follow-up from from this. So you'll get the recording and and sort of the tips and tricks and as well as the contact info for us. Okay. Yeah. We can turn that around pretty quickly. <laughs> Great. Um, and for those of you who are on the phone and not on the, um, the, the video, um, Liz just mentioned that ideally recruiting others to send letters to the editor on the same topic so the paper will see that it's an important issue and publish at least one of those um, is really a great, a great tactic. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, last call for questions. <laughs> Have you uh, contacted any of the major solar manufacturers uh, and asked them to send letters? Uh, I would think that might have a little more oomph. Glenn, do you want to take this? We have definitely been in touch with a lot of solar uh, industry groups. Glenn has been most closely coordinating, but if Glenn's yeah, the answer well, the the answer is absolutely. Um, we work closely with them on a lot of issues. This is one that is of national um, prominence, and the impact is going to be widespread. Um, they're concerned about it. They are the best messengers to talk about solar jobs, and so when they and we encourage them when they communicate to, to focus on the number of of jobs that they're creating, these are local jobs. You know, you can't get somebody from China and India to, to install on your roof, right? So um, 
they're strong messengers for people who care about the economic impacts of the solar industry. Uh, we're doing a webinar just for solar installers uh, on, on Friday. And uh, we'll be talking about letters to the editor there. They have a lot of technical questions and taxation policy questions and you know, stuff that's narrowly related to their world. <clears throat> um, but absolutely, we encourage them to do it. Um, you know, we think it's really important that there be a consumer solar homeowner perspective, a solar supporter perspective, a, a, a solar business perspective, a governor who cares about or an attorney general who cares, doesn't care about solar at all, but cares about solar uh, states' rights. I think we, that's the way to, what we think is the way to, to win in this, and to get FERC to back off. But this is Aaron asking a question. So did anything happen last week that you can tell us about that, good or bad, you know, like a little quick update since we got you here in person? The only update I could give you is that we have seen a lot of states uh, Liz, I don't know if you have that map, but we have a, there's a map of all the states that have taken action uh, in terms of intervening in the, formally into the proceedings with FERC. Um, the map is not as filled in as we would like it, hmm. but um, there are there are, I think it's 22 states uh, or state agencies have intervened at this point, if I remember correctly. Um, some of them, it's not clear at all what position they're taking. Uh, that is, they, you can intervene in opposition, but you can also intervene in support. Um, we're assuming that most of the interventions by the states are going to be in opposition to the petition, which is encouraging, but not all of them. I mean, frankly, I think some of them are going to just uh, oppose the petition on a state's rights. Uh, there we go, thank you very much. There's the screen. So if you take a look at this map, you can see there's still a lot of gray. Gray is that they haven't acted yet. The ones that are checkered pattern, or I don't know how to describe it, with the, the, the uh, slanted bars, uh, those uh, are states that we think are represented, we're pretty sure are represented by a larger organization of uh, public utility commissions. Um, so we think they're, they're on board in, in intervening. But you see, we have a lot of work to do. Mm. On the other hand, I would say that's a pretty good start. Thank you. And one thing I forgot to mention, I think somebody brought it up, I know Liz or Glenn, in terms of like how many jobs um, are created by the solar installation. We, if you went solar with us, we do actually have that information. So if you are writing a letter and would like to mention something like that, generally for your own specific installation, it's not a super impressive number, but if you went solar in a co-op, that number ends up being more impressive. So we're happy to provide you with that information if you want to reach out. Um, and again, it's that get involved at solarunitedneighbors.org and, and we can look that up pretty easily for you. So, um, but again, we'd give you like the co-op number because you know, your one installation may be Point five of a job, which doesn't have the same impact as, you know, 10 or 15, so. I think an interesting spin on this is, um, then is the timing of the petition. You know, this is coming during this public health crisis um, where our economy is in real strain, put it mildly. Um, and any action that would reduce economic activity, job creation, particularly local ones, uh, seems so counterproductive, perverse. And so I think some people are, are, are saying this is, no matter how you feel about states' rights or solar policy, this is the wrong time for, for to even think about this petition. I think it's an interesting angle. It's not something every person would want to make. I know that some of the installers feel that, particularly they've had to lay people off, furlough people, and yet here there's a threat to their business model. So um, not everybody will care about that, but I actually think it's the timing makes it a little more relevant. You know, uh, if one is cynical, one could see this as an attempt to sneak something through during a time when people are legitimately distracted by more important public health issues. Um, and, you know, I kind of think that's a part of it. I don't know if that's, you know, everything, but it's kind of appalling to me. Yeah, 
state of okay. to read your state's vibe on that one <laughs> for pitching that. Well, thanks. You guys are all great. I'm going to send you a revised letter just because I'd appreciate some feedback. Thank you so much, Erin. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Any other questions from anybody before we give you back 15 minutes? <laughs> awesome. Well, again, we'll send out the follow-up, um, which will include just some talking points as well as the recording um, and, and for that contact information if you do want to send a draft letter tomorrow. Um, and we really appreciate you taking the time to be here and to, to ask your questions. And Mike, thank you so, so much for participating and for giving your perspective. That was really, really valuable. So. My pleasure. Right. My pleasure. All right. Well, everybody stay safe and healthy and we'll, we hope to see you soon. Have a good rest of your day. Bye. Thanks everybody. Bye.